Now, there are a lot of people who make a variety of insufficient claims about African people and African history. One of the main ones that come up is this discussion and this dichotomy between so-called ancient Kimi or Kemet and the Negro Congo speakers. In that a lot of individuals say that you cannot trace contemporary Western Central Africans to the classical civilizations on the Happy River Valley because these are so-called Negro Congo speakers, or they descend from the Niger Congo language phylum. Now, as many of you know, the Negro Congo or Niger Congo languages have never been completely confirmed and established using the diachronic comparative method. These are synchronic languages that have been grouped together using the multilateral comparative method or Greenberg's mass comparison analysis. And believe it or not, there are many different flaws within the so-called Negro Congo language family. Some of these have been compiled by a scholar by the name of Roger Blench, who is one of the most famous Negro Congo linguists. And if he can see flaws within the construction of the Negro Congo languages, it's obvious that this is a working hypothesis and it is not to be taken as a historical population. First off, you cannot construct a language phylum unless you have good arguments about which language families it includes. The most striking case is Altaic, which one group of scholars produces thousands of reconstructed forms, and another denies that the major branches are even related. The most extreme case for Negro Congo is Dimondal's 2011 book, which rejects numerous established branches and treats them as independent. No evidence is offered for this, so the case is hard to assess, but even more positive assessments may have trouble with Dogon. You also can't reconstruct a language phylum unless you can also explain the position of unclassified or independent branches. Good examples of this are Bili, Bijogo, Mpra, which look Negro Congo, but are difficult to assign to known branches. You also can't reconstruct a language phylum unless you have a convincing model of its internal structure. In the case of Negro Congo, this is of particular importance. There is an extensive literature discussing the likely noun classes, verbal extensions, word order, and so on of Niger Congo. But there are, for example, a number of branches where there is no evidence for noun classes, such as Dogon, Ijo, Mande, Kualagdumurik, etc. Is this because they have been lost? If so, it is incumbent on the proponent to demonstrate how this occurred. Dogon, for example, has no labial velars and no evidence for ATR vowels, which are present almost everywhere else. If they were indeed lost, the proponents of their presence in Proto-Negro Congo phonology should be able to demonstrate sound correspondences indicating their former existence in Proto-Dogon. Needless to say, crucial analytic studies of this type do not exist. Next, if you conflate aerial groupings with genetic units, notably erecting Bontoid into some sort of family, then again, it will be difficult to make sense of this data. With these caveats in mind, the following presents a review of existing or proposed groupings as a research tool without sorting out these rather basic questions. It is difficult to imagine a credible reconstruction of Proto-Negro Congo. Table 1 presents extreme and rather simplified versions of basic positions. And you can see the different positions here, the opposing views within the field of historical reconstruction. And then the next table here evaluates the degrees of evidence for major claimed branches of Negro Congo. So first you have Dogon. Dogon is certainly a well-founded and coherent group but it has no characteristic Negro Congo features in its noun classes, verbal extensions, labial velars, etc., and very few lexical cognates. It could equally be a completely independent language family. When we look at Ejoid, the Ejo languages constitute a well-founded group, but the membership of Defaka remains problematic. Defaka has numerous external cognates and might be an isolate or independent branch of Negro Congo, which has come under Ejo influence. Kordofanian, by many, is not even considered part of Negro Congo due to a failure to engage in reconstruction. Haibantaloidi is usually considered a group. Rashad Kualak is perhaps a group, but the absence of noun classes in Kualak and part of Rashad remains problematic. When it comes to Tegum Amira, Tegum has similarities to Tolodi, but a highly divergent lexicon provisionally considered an independent branch. Mande is relatively speaking a coherent group, 
When it comes to North Atlantic, no strong argument in print for the coherence of all the members, but many speculate that they are related. South Atlantic and crew tend to be considered coherent groups. Sanufic is a coherent group and previously treated as part of GUR, but no good argument exists for this. GUR is fairly coherent, but the argument that some Western Adamawa languages are closer to GUR than those further east is apparently well founded. When it comes to Adamawa, there is no evidence that all clan members really form a genetic group. Fali and Daka have been expunged. Much hangs on a typological feature and noun class suffixes which must be argued as disappeared in some branches. When it comes to Ubangian, it's not a group and no evidence has been presented for a particular relationship with Adamawa, although geographic proximity makes this likely. Baya is either Adamawa linked or an independent branch of Negro Congo. When it comes to Kwa, no argument in print for the coherence of all members. When it comes to Volta Niger, previously this was part of Eastern Kwa and Western Benu Congo. When it comes to Benu Congo, if treated as the noun class languages east and north of Niger, it is a likely group, but there is no argument in print for its coherence. Bendi is not included as part of the Cross River languages. When it comes to Bantoy, this is definitely not a group. There have been those who have argued for Northern Bantoy consisting of Dakoid, Mamboloid, and Tikar, but the remaining small groups in Grassfields, Tivoid, etc. are independent branches within the Benu Congo and so-called Bantu borderland. When it comes to Bantu, this is definitely not a group. And this may seem surprising in light of the published claims to the contrary, but the argument from a comparative linguistic perspective, which links the highly diverse languages of Zone A to a genuine reconstruction, is absolutely non-existent. Most scholars claim that Proto-Bantu is either confined to a particular subgroup or is widely attested outside of Bantu proper. Apart from these groups, there are a number of languages which look Negro Congo but which cannot easily be assigned to any definitive genetic group. Of course, if for example Kwa or Ubangian falls apart, then the number will be much larger. Table 3 shows a summary of the minor claimed branches of Niger Congo. So you have Mpra, which has Western Kwa cognates and may either be an isolate with borrowings or a highly divergent branch of Kwa, and this is completely extinct so no more evidence can be collected. You have Berry, which has Mande and Kru borrowings but is not affiliated to either. Ega, possibly Kwa but a few cognates. Fali, formerly assigned to Adamawa and the evidence is very weak. Bijogo, formerly assigned to Atlantic on geographical grounds and it is completely hard to place. Econ, the noun classes in Concord make it look Benu Congo but the evidence is weak. And you have Bangame, formerly assigned to Niger Congo, but improved evidence makes the case weaker. So in conclusion, historical linguists should proceed by evidence-based approaches and not assertion. For all its critics, the comparative method is the only one which has long-term traceability. So now we're going to get into Dr. Kenneth Olson's analysis of some of the flaws of Negro Congo. Now, his study of Negro Congo classification brings up two important issues. One being the completeness of documentation and the availability of data supporting the claims which have been made, and the role and validity of the different methodologies which are used in making the classifications. With respect to data and documentation, Olson examines the works of three scholars in Greenberg, Bennett, and Sturck. All three scholars provide brief overviews of the type of data used, but fail to provide complete references as to the source of the data. Bennett and Sturck state, it would be impossible to list all of the languages that we consulted. This leaves the reader with no means within the published literature of checking and verifying the claims made in the paper. It also means that the reader has no way of assessing the integrity of the data. So again, when it comes to Bennett and Sturck, one of the most prominent scholars in Niger Congo linguistics, their data is lacking. It's faulty. They don't necessarily have evidence to back up their linguistic claims. Regarding Greenberg, it's von Fodor states, there are many controversial, ambiguous, or to be candid, incorrect data in the material of Greenberg. To avoid misunderstandings, it would have been more fitting to indicate in each case the source Greenberg relied on. Now Olson wants to illustrate this point. Bennett makes a passing reference to the fact that he has access to the Dictionary of Banda by Tisserand. I can presume from my knowledge of published material at the time that this was also the source of Banda data for Greenberg. Now though Tisserand's dictionary is certainly a valuable source, it has serious flaws, especially in its completeness regarding dialectical variation and its accuracy concerning vowel quality and tone. From my own library and field research on Banda, 
I have access to more recent data on the language family, both published and personally elicited. As a result, I have the means of assessing the accuracy of the data which Greenberg and Bennett cite for Banda. However, the case of Banda is the exception. Since most of the language is cited, the reader does not know the source of the data, unless he is able to find out directly from the author. In the cases where data are provided, they are often incomplete. Greenberg provides a 49-item word list for Negro Congo. In it, he only lists forms that he determines are cognate across most of the groups, and he limits citations to three from each group. As a result, there is no way to check cognate percentages from his data. In addition, there is no way to identify possible lexical innovations for each group or subgroup. These limitations thus reduce the usefulness of the word list for research purposes. Bennett and Sturck do not provide word lists in their paper either. Rather, they list only the names of the languages for which they have word lists, the glosses for which they have words, and the percentages of shared cognates. From this, the reader can check the glosses for the presence of cultural vocabulary, but the reader is unable to verify the cognate percentages. These data are only provided for the part of their study that gives an overview of Negro Congo. For the part of their study that focuses on Kwa and Benu Congo, they provide no data. To their credit, Bennett and Sturck do give a good description of the procedure they use in analyzing the data. However, Bennett provides neither word list nor cognate percentages, but only lists the languages in glosses. Though the paper claims a certain classification based on lexical statistics, the reader is left without any knowledge of the cognate percentages on which the classification is made. And this, from a historical linguistic perspective, is an absolute no-no. The data is just completely incomplete. Now Olson moves on. The second major issue in Negro Congo classification is one of methodology. The accuracy of the genetic classification is of course dependent on the accuracy of the methodology upon which the classification is made. To date, the conclusions regarding Negro Congo classification have been based predominantly on the method of resemblances, lexical statistics, and evidence from shared innovations. Very little has been based on the historical reconstruction using the comparative method. Some authors, such as Bennett and Sturck, offer reconstructed lexical items as evidence for shared innovations, but they unfortunately do not provide a detailed account of how they arrive at these reconstructed forms. In the following sections, I will briefly discuss issues related to the assorted methodologies that have been used in establishing Negro Congo classification. First, Greenberg's classification of Negro Congo is based upon his method of resemblances. This method is often referred to as mass comparison, but this term refers to only part of the classification method. The method has been extremely influential in African linguistics and also the source of much controversy. Because of its importance in the field of African linguistics and its relevance to the topic of the paper, I will give an overview of the method. Greenberg considers the method of resemblances to be a preliminary step to make hypotheses about the genetic relationship of languages. Its goal is more to determine if languages are related than the degree to which they are related. Once the method of resemblances is established that the languages are related, the comparative method may be used to perform a historical reconstruction of the proto-language and in the process extract sound laws and establish the genetic relatedness of the languages. There are two basic principles underlying the method of resemblances. First, one identifies cross-linguistic resemblances that involve form and meaning. These resemblances may be between lexical items or between grammatical elements of the languages compared. Consider a trivial example that demonstrates the relevance of both form and meaning. Both English and Mono in Congo have words pronounced shoe. The Mono word means to be bitter, whereas in English it refers to an item worn on the foot. In this case, there was a resemblance in form, but no resemblance in meaning. Indeed, there is no known historical connection between the two words, and the likelihood of a connection is very slim. However, a simple resemblance in form and meaning is not enough to establish a genetic relationship. Greenberg lists four possible sources of such resemblance. First, the forms may be related genetically. Second, it is possible that one language borrowed the form from another. This is often the case in languages that are close in geographic proximity. Third, the resemblance may be due to sound symbolism, as in the case of onomatopoeia. For example, the mono word for cat is meow. The pronunciation of this word bears striking similarity to the English word meow and is likely due to onomatopoeia. Fourth, a resemblance may be due to pure chance. For example, in the Australian language Bambaram, the word for dog is dog. The first step, then, is to remove non-historic factors, symbolism and chance, as possible explanations of the resemblances. Greenberg suggests three diagnostics. First, if the percentage of the resemblance between the two languages is greater than 20%, then these factors may be eliminated from consideration. Second, the longer a form, the less likely it is due to chance. Third, the presence of similar suppletive morphological alternates is strong evidence for a historical connection. For example, the odds are rather low that resemblances between the English paradigm good, bet, be, or good, better, best, and the German one gut, best, be is due to pure chance. 
The next step is to remove a borrowing as a factor. Greenberg claims it is always a possibility to tell whether a mass resemblance between the two languages is the result of borrowing. The main means to reduce the chance of borrowing is to eliminate cultural words from consideration and only rely on basic vocabulary and grammatical morphemes, items that are assumed to be the most resistant to borrowing. Greenberg's claim may be a bit overstated as basic vocabulary and grammatical constructions are not always immune to borrowing. For example, in Mono, the negation marker nene is being replaced in the language by the Lingala negative marker te. The second major principle underlying the method of resemblances is mass comparison or group comparison. This is basically the notion of identifying resemblances across a broad scope of languages rather than isolated comparisons of pairs of languages. Greenberg claims that the larger number of languages that exhibit a certain resemblance, the less likely that the resemblance is due to chance, symbolism, or borrowing. The method of resemblances has been widely criticized in the literature. In some cases, such as in Dixon's 1997 work, it is discounted as being simply typological in nature, but this is a mischaracterization. Other researchers have posited more substantial criticisms. First, Bennett and Stark accept that Greenberg's method is adequate for demonstrating relationship, but they say that it is not suited for the investigation of degrees of relationships and subgroupings. Indeed, this appears to be a problem for Greenberg. A second criticism of Greenberg's method is his avoiding of positing sound laws. Both Schachter in 1971 and Fodor in 1969 point this out. His critics argue Greenberg, although he has presented a long list of putative cognates among languages for he claims genetic relationship, has not specified precise sound correspondences, and thus has failed to produce the only proof of cognation that is acceptable in standard comparative linguistic practices. Now, a lot of these criticisms ignore essential caveat that Greenberg states explicitly in 1957. He insists that the conclusions drawn from his method are to be considered tentative. He sees them as hypotheses to be verified and expanded upon implementation of the comparative method. In other words, the value of his method is not in the firm conclusions that it draws, but rather in the creation of a scaffolding from which other research may be built. Greenberg states, the establishment of valid hypotheses concerning genetic relationships among languages is a necessary preliminary to the systematic reconstruction of their historical development. The appropriate techniques cannot be applied to languages chosen at random, but only if preliminary investigation has been already indicated in the likelihood of the success of such an enterprise. Greenberg thus does not intend for his method to replace the comparative method, but rather complement it. And again, that's important because for all of those who use Afroasiatic, Bontoid, Negro, Congo, Khoisan, Nilo, Saharan, as if they're affirmed historical populations, Greenberg, out of his own words, said that they are hypothetical. They are working hypotheses. They are not meant to be considered as historically affirmed population. Now, other methods used within you know, mass comparison in, in Greenberg's multilateral comparative analysis are lexico statistics. And lexico statistics, you know, being used in tandem with glottal chronology have problems because the rate of change of languages is not constant. It changes over time due to socio political and cultural influences. So the fact that this is used to suggest that it can create a genetic relationship or it could reveal genetic relationship between different language families is absolute bunk. Then you have shared innovation. Evidence from shared innovations has also been used in Negro Congo classification, often in conjunction with lexical statistics in order to justify certain nodes in the classification. It is assumed that if a language produces an innovation at a certain point of time, then all of the descendants of that language will have that form, whereas all externally related languages will not. This, of course, runs the risk of skewing due to borrowing's chance for symbolism, just as in the method of resemblances in lexical statistics. Williamson points out another problem. There is a certain problem in the use of lexical innovations in that they most often come through semantic shift. Since this process may occur repeatedly and independently, it is not fully reliable. In addition, in this study, we have seen how there can be confusion between isoglosses or linguistic boundaries and innovations. Even though an isogloss indicates a geographic boundary of linguistic rules, this may not necessarily indicate that the opposing words both represent innovations at the same genetic level.
So the comparative method, which has not been used in Negro Congo, has been traditionally considered the most accurate means by which to establish the genetic relationship between languages. This method involves comparing lexical items and grammatical forms between languages, setting up correspondences between the phonemes of the languages, and then making hypotheses about the structure of the proto-language and the sound laws that led to the development of the present-day languages in the family. The use of the comparative method has been neglected in Negro Congo classification. It has been used sometimes on a micro level to establish the genetic relationship of certain subgroups within Negro Congo, but to date there has been no concerted effort to establish a proto-system for Negro Congo as a whole, along with the sound laws which led to the modern languages in the family. Dixon even calls into question the appropriateness of applying the comparative method to Negro Congo at all. According to his punctuated equilibrium model of language change, the Niger-Congo languages have been a state of equilibrium in which aerial features have diffused over the geographic region through borrowing, effectively masking the type of language change typically associated with historical reconstruction. As a result, he doubts that an accurate reconstruction of proto-Niger-Congo is possible. Again, according to this particular linguist, an accurate reconstruction of proto-Niger-Congo is not possible. So it is clear from this overview of Niger Congo language classification that so much more work needs to be done in this realm if it is even possible to reconstruct the pre dialectical ancestor. The exact placement of Ejoid crew and Dogon within a Niger Congo genetic tree remains to be determined. Whether several linguistic groups, Atlantic, Nuqua, Nubenu, Congo, Wide Bantu, Narrow Bantu, and Adamawa, Ubangi are each a unity also remains to be established. Until now, the Niger Congo classification has been influenced predominantly by the work of using the method of resemblances and then by using lexical statistics and shared innovations. While these methods may be useful for approximating gross groupings, there are serious questions about the precision that can be obtained using their application. While the comparative method has been occasionally applied to small language families within Niger Congo, particularly certain nodes of Bantu, its use has so far been neglected in typing the language family together as a whole. A comprehensive reconstruction of Negro Congo, including the establishment of sound laws, is the main barrier and the future task which some linguists state is impossible of any sort of accurate Niger Congo classification. So as you can see it's obvious that there are so many different issues with Niger Congo or Negro Congo as specified by the linguist Kenneth Olson as well as Roger Blench who by the way is a Greenbergian and actually believes in that type of hypothetical analysis in the multilateral comparative method that Greenberg used. And it is absolutely insane to say that most Africans or most black people in the diaspora are so-called Negro Congo people or descend from Negroid Congoids and cannot connect themselves to the civilizations of the Happy River Valley. When it comes to the analysis of the connection between Metrem and Kimi in the modern languages of Inner Africa, they actually have been established using the historical comparative method. And there is a myriad of scholars from Giop to Obenga to even Dr. Kamal Cambone who are engaging within the accurate analysis of the language families on the African continent. And this is what's called Paleo-African linguistics. And on the flip side, along with the usage of the historical comparative method, when it comes to establishing this relationship, we also have the pluridisciplinary approach that combines different fields like historiography, archaeology, archaeogenetics, architecture, you know, epigraphy, you know, sociocultural analysis, cultural anthropology to bridge the gap between the pharaonic civilization and the civilizations of contemporary Africa. So according to the evidence, it is definitely more accurate to connect the majority of African people to the Happy River Valley cradle within classical Africa as the fountain of our cultural unity. It is completely inaccurate to try to pigeonhole the majority of black people into the Negro Congo plantation because it is completely invalid and ahistorical.